Welcome to the Command Post Podcast, powered by First Do. I'm your host, Tom Lewis, First Do's Enterprise Training Manager. I am pleased to welcome Kristen Willemeyer, PhD and author of Biohack Your Brain, How to Boost Cognitive Health, Proficiency and Power, to today's episode of the podcast. Dr. Willemeyer is a neuroscientist with research expertise in neurobiology and neuroimaging. She received a BA in psychology from Boston College, an MS in physiological science from the UCLA College of Letters and Science, and an MS and PhD in neurobiology from the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine. She was a postdoctoral scientist in the Department of Neurology at Cedar sinai Medical Center, where she continued her work in the field of neurogenerative disease. She was the recipient of a National Research Service Award Fellowship from the National Institutes of Health and has presented her work internationally. She served as the Director of Neuroimaging and Clinical Research for the Amen Clinics, where she led the effort to utilize imaging technologies to understand the neurobiological signatures underlying psychiatric disorders. Dr. Willemeyer is widely published and has co-authored manuscripts in leading peer-reviewed journals, including the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, Translational Psychiatry, the Journal of Neuroscientist, and the Journal of Nuclear Medicine. I am grateful to have such a distinguished scientist on the podcast today. Welcome, Dr. Willemeyer. Dr. Willemeyer, so great to have you here today. Thank you for joining us on the Command Post podcast. Tom, it is truly my honor and pleasure to be here with you today. You know, I love the fire service. They are near and dear to my heart. So thank you for well, the, the, having the, me join you. No, oh, the, the feeling is, is most definitely mutual. And I know uh, our listeners and viewers are going to get a lot of what, what we're talking about today. I know in our last encounter um, for a virtual summit that we had did a couple of mm-hmm. years ago, um, your your presentation was wildly popular and um, is still talked about, still talked about today. So. <laughs> that, you made my day. Thank you so much. I loved presenting to your group, and you know, as the daughter of a firefighter. Um, I am just so honored to be here and and speaking with you and sharing knowledge with your community. Thank you so much. So you're a neuroscientist. So what was the, (laughs) what was the spark that got you into this, that, that, uh, that helped you become basically a leader in your field? Oh boy. So we're going back 20, 25 years ago. (laughs) I actually thought I was going to be an MD and uh you know i love working with people and thought i was going to be probably a surgeon working in the operating room i was very lucky in chicago i got my start um working with a gentleman by the name of dr kenneth stein and i was working in the operating room he was a craniofacial microsurgeon and i watched surgeries all day i was completely fascinated and loved it and said this is what i want to do And I will share this with you. I don't think I've really shared this on many podcasts, but I happened to be dating somebody who was brilliant, um, Harvard-trained doctor who actually worked um, with the New England Patriots, who was one of the consulting physicians for the Patriots. And he convinced me not to go to medical school, but to go into science because he sensed that I had a scientific aptitude that I wasn't even aware of. So I really, to this day, credit um, Marcus Elliott, is his name. I credit Marcus for really sort of helping me go more into the scientific realm. So what I did was, instead of applying to medical school, I applied to UCLA to do a master's degree in physiological science. And I will tell you, that's the major that most kids go into to go to medical school. Yes. But I was one of the people who went in it to see if I really gravitated towards science. And I worked in a laboratory of neuroendocrinology, working in a species of fish, studying an enzyme called the aromatase enzyme, which is important for um, for taking testosterone and converting it to estrogen. And Mm. so I really was a basic scientist and I fell in love. I, he, Marcus was absolutely right. I got into a laboratory setting. I fell in love. I had so much fun. I knew this was my calling. So I spent the next 10 years in academic medicine, you know, getting my degrees, working in laboratories, um, dissecting the brains of rats and mice and you know, wow. the intestines of guinea pigs. I mean, I'm, I'm really a basic scientist at heart. So that's the neurobiologist piece. 
Um, and during that time is when I got interested in the Parkinson's research. So I started studying a gene that was implicated in the young onset form of Parkinson's disease and figuring out um, what goes awry. So sort of what intracellular signaling mechanisms go awry when you have this particular genetic mutation. But of course, I also fell in love with the Parkinson's patients. So me as a research scientist, I didn't just work in the lab. I would um, invest time going to the Parkinson's groups and talking with the patients. So I wanted to sort of understand, here I am, the research scientist, how can I help you? How can I connect with your community? And as you know, my father ended up getting Parkinson's, which I always think, you know, there's maybe no mistakes why we're guided into certain careers. So, mm. um, you know, that's just sort of another layer to the story. But I fell in love with neuroscience. And then after leaving academic medicine, as you had mentioned, I went uh, to work in the clinical setting at the Amen Clinics, where I got to work with patients in the psychiatric setting, but using um, neuroimaging. So instead of dissecting the brains of rats and mice and fish, uh, I actually got to look at neuroimages of patients who are struggling with various psychiatric disorders, anxiety, depression, OCD, bipolar issues, autism, um, you know, and that was really meaningful to me because it really sort of married the two components of who I am, a scientist and somebody who really also wanted to work uh, in the clinical setting. That's amazing. So mm -hmm. even though he's a patriot, he's a good guy, huh? What? Oh, oh, the New England. Oh, New England. I know. It's, well, you know what? I went to school in Boston, so I went to Boston College. Uh, but I'm I'm actually from Chicago, so I'm a diehard Chicago Bears fan. Right. And every year, <laughs> every year it's tough, but I'm you know rooting for my my Bears. I'm rooting for the Bears. Oh, it's yeah. great. It's, a, it's a great story, you know. And my it's interesting that you mentioned the physiology. My daughter minored in it, right, in uh, undergrad, not minor. Uh -huh. She majored in it as her undergrad degree, and and she's um, looking to do an MD PhD program. So there you go. You knew that's why you were shaking your head. I yes. said pretty much everybody in my class uh, was doing that physiological science program right. to be able to get to the top medical schools. And I was a TA for the physiological science oh, okay. program at UCLA. And trust me, every every student was going to medical school. That was the major. Uh, to get you prepared for medical school. And what I love about UCLA, the curriculum was so rigorous that those who performed very well in the curriculum and went off to medical school often found their first year of medical school very easy. So I will tell you, UCLA is, UCLA is tough. Um, but they really prepare you right. uh, for the real world, whether you're, you know, going in, you know, to become a scientist like myself. I mean, it was an extraordinarily rigorous research program. And they hold up the bar very high in terms of standards. And that's why you mentioned, you know, I've gotten funding by the NIH. I mean, you really have to perform well. But what I loved about being in that environment are so many brilliant people, I I mean, Nobel laureates. Like I'm, I'm just in the presence of greatness. So I spent, you know, 10 years just soaking up knowledge from these brilliant professors. It was really sweet. We had a what we call a synaptic journal club. And one of the professors in my department, the Department of Neurobiology, um, was in his 90s. And he would come in and watch us students present our data, you know, give input. And I was always so grateful that he would come in and listen to what we had to say. But he always knew we were the future generations, right? We were going to be bringing neuroscience right into the 21st century, so to speak. And now, my gosh, talk about neuroscience and big data. You and I were talking about this before uh, the podcast started. I mean, it's really exploded. You know, my field um, has really merged with healthcare and AI, and it's transforming the world. It's amazing. It's a lot to keep mm -hmm. up with. Mm -hmm. So we've talked and you've mentioned you have a soft spot for the fire service. And your, heart, yes. your, your, heart's, your heart's with us in, 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 you know, in, in a pretty special Forever. way. Yeah. So how, tell us. How did that come about? Well, as I've already mentioned, I am the daughter of a firefighter. My dad spent, you know, over 25 years in the fire service and, you know, starting back in the 70s. So I grew up in Chicago in an area called Long Grove. So he joined the Long Grove Fire Department 
Um, at the same time, he was also a pilot for Pan American. So this was the time when you could have a dual career. So he'd be, he wow. flew 747, so he'd be flying all over the world. He'd come home and then he'd rush off to, to answer fire calls. And I remember, so I was born in 72. I remember my dad would come home and he'd come home from a fire call, right, with soot. I mean, just, you know, black face, like coughing, like coughing up stuff. But he just loved it. He's the guy who would ride his motorcycle into the fire department or put me on the back of the motorcycle, by the way, and leave me at the fire department while he went off to do right. fire calls. So I'm also the girl that hung out with the Dalmatian and the station. Oh, my gosh. What a great childhood. Do you, do you remember? Like, the, those are sort of the well, early yeah. days. And, and, well, in the days, you know, where, you know, you come home with soot and dirty turnouts. And, and we yeah. showed us that's no longer, right? Those are not. Those that are is no longer. But my dad loved it, yeah, right? Yeah. My dad was a man's man, right? Yep, he was yep. a combat helicopter pilot in Vietnam, pilot for Pan Am firefighter you know for almost three decades and loved it you know rode motorcycles rode horses played basketball he was just this you know man who loved life and you know loved serving his community so he went from long grove um fire department to the barrington fire department okay. where he stayed until he retired my gosh i want to say it was 2005 when he retired and he had to because of his age um, but I'm still so close with so many people in the fire community. Now, as I've already shared with you, my, my father ended up getting Parkinson's disease. Yes. Um, he was, it started in his seventies, sort of the, the shaking, the tremors, the shuffling gait, the falling. But, you know, when I spoke to my father about it, when the behaviors became quite pronounced, he confided in me that this had really started back in his fifties. You know, the noticing of the, the tremors in his hands. Um, it's kind of, it's sort of the equivalent of, you know, when your eyes are starting to get bad mm, and I you do, squint <laughs> and you don't get your glasses and, you know, you really wait and you're like, no, I can see. And then you actually go to the doctor um, and they tell you, you know what, you really need glasses. So I think my dad spent, you know, close to a decade, two decades dealing with this until the symptoms were so pronounced in his 70s and he did end up passing uh, at 78. Oh. Not from Parkinson's, uh, he had a routine knee surgery that went septic. Oh, no. uh, but I but I always say I think, you know, my dad wasn't able to do the things that he really enjoyed, you know, riding his horses, riding the motorcycle. So I, I always say it was probably perfect timing. But, you know, I am a daughter that grew up with the fire service at all of the firefighter events and firefighter picnics and you know my dad has been in a lot of very big fires that we've had in barrington he almost had a i remember he went to a barn fire and it was one of the biggest fires they had had in barrington um and he went in and you know how they come in with the hoses and there was something on the top of the roof so the roof caved in Sure. And he was almost in there. So my dad has had uh, so many of these close calls, the close calls. Yeah. He's escaped death many, many times. Cause I'm <laughs> sure many people in the fire service have, you all have your stories. Um, but I just, you know, in my heart, I'm always going to be connected to the fire service and do whatever I can to help support those in the fire service. And, you know, with regards to his Parkinson's people have asked me, do you think it's, you know, his close to three decades of exposure to all of the toxic chemicals that cause this, because we don't have Parkinson's in our family, no genetic okay. form of Parkinson's. Um, and in response to that, now, as I said, my dad was a combat helicopter pilot in Vietnam, so he was exposed right. to Agent Orange. And you know, I feel different. like in my father's case, the combined exposure from, you know, Agent Orange to, again, being a pilot and the fumes that okay. you're exposed to, yep. plus the fire service. It's almost like he got it triple, you know, he, he <laughs> and he had incredible habits in, in terms of brain health habits. I mean, tall, lean, healthy his whole life. And, and you know this, I, I, you know, presented his story um, during the firefighter conference. So, you know, for all intents and purposes, he really did live a full, healthy life. And 
you know, at some point, sometimes that toxic exposure just over time does a number on your nervous system. And yeah, that's the, probably the, what... the chronic exposure, right? The repeated yeah. chronic exposure. So, well, we're grateful you have a connection to the fire service. And I, I think we should do a shout out because um, I'm grateful to Chief Randy Brugman for connecting us. So he is. You Thank know, you, just, Chief. <laughs> He's just one of the best, right? So we love Chief Brugman. Yes, we do. We do. So coming from both the fire service and the tech industry, right? So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm kind of has merged some of my passions. Um, the title of your book, Biohack Your Brain, How to Boost Cognitive Health, Performance, and Power, was appealing to me, immediately appealing to me. So biohack, when when with that term, right, it implies that we can all take an active role in enhancing our cognitive well-being. So kind of share a little bit about what your research has revealed about the most important things we can do to have just healthier brains, both. And again, it's, it's the combination of the physiological aspect that mm -hmm. contributes to the healthy mental aspects as well. So, so biohacking it, what can we do to biohack our brains? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that great introduction. I almost want to quiz you and ask you what you're doing to biohack your brain. But before I do, I'm going to okay. give you a minute to think about that. Okay. Um, I wanted to share with your audience, there's a reason why I wrote this book and why it has that title, Biohack Your Brain. Um, you know, back in 2009, when I was at the Amen Clinics. We did one of the world's largest brain imaging studies in living professional football players. Mm. And the question was, does playing football cause long-term brain damage? And again, 2009, not a lot of people are talking about it. This predates the 2015 uh, concussion movie where Will Smith played yeah. Ben Amalu, right? Ben Amalu having discovered CTE in Pittsburgh Hall of Fame um center mike webster so so we were asking this question and we worked with you know 15 players so the, the study actually had 100 participants but after working with the first 15 players the answer was a resounding uh yes you know participation in this sport this collision-based sport yeah uh that causes um shearing and tearing of the very delicate neurons in your brain and it's repeated so these players are taking tens of thousands of hits over the course of a career. So we saw using functional electrical imaging that it damaged the brain. But here was the exciting part, um, because the Amen Clinics cares about treating patients. We're not just there running research studies. We want to help improve the quality of people's life. We decided to have what we call an open label study with the players. And we were offering dietary and lifestyle interventions for free and I was running a brain directed weight loss group for the players to help them get brain fit and healthy okay. and to get lean because having excess weight on the body is inflammatory. That's actually a chronic inflammatory process and any kind of inflammation, not good for the brain. Um, and put the players on a suite of nutraceuticals, um, just very easy. Again, it's like first do no harm. We're not going to give medications. Let's see what we so, nutraceuticals. If for, the, for those that might not those, be familiar with that term. Ah, good. Yeah, nutraceuticals are just, um, uh, it's a supplement. So their okay. nutraceuticals are um, not pharmaceuticals, but they're the use of sort of functional plants and botanicals that okay. can be taken, right, in a capsule that can help cause a physiological change in the body. Uh, so we, and nutraceuticals, think omega-3 fatty acids, think Got curcumin. Yep, yep. Okay. Good. And even a, even, uh, a, even a even a high quality multivitamin would, would be in that class true right high quality multivitamin vitamin C so any it could be anything you know so plants have what are called polyphenols they have hundreds yeah. of them they're chemicals that are in a plant that you can extract and put in a capsule and we can call that it's like a functional food in a way okay. or a okay. functional nutrient not a pharmaceutical. <laughs> um, the, beautiful, the beautiful thing about nutraceuticals is that um, they tend to have very minimal side effects, if any side effects. Okay. And that's one of the great reasons to try them before going to medication, which all medications have side effects. Podcast for another time, right? Right. So, Dietary and lifestyle interventions for the football players, you know, helping them get brain healthy, helping them learn what kind of foods to eat, what kind of dietary patterns to follow, what kind of nutraceuticals um, 
cognitive, we actually, because we did brain imaging and had them do cognitive assessments, we knew what area, what areas they were weak in cognitively and were able to give them very specific brain training games to support their cognitive health. Again, all things that anybody listening to this podcast can do. Um, we had the fancier tools available as well, like hyperbaric oxygen chambers and transcranial magnetic stimulation, neurofeedback and medications. But the initial um, component of the study was just supposed to be very simple, you know, things that everybody could do on their own. Okay. We had the players do them for six months. And I go, so I sort of go into the details of what they did in the book okay. and had them come back for follow up scans. And we were able to show, which actually surprised me because I had just started working at the clinic and I was completely unaware that these very accessible dietary and lifestyle interventions could make measurable changes that we could see on brain imaging. And those changes are changes in blood flow and activity patterns. And why is blood flow so important? It's one of the number one things you need to keep going to your brain if you want to have a long, healthy lifestyle. Um, most people are walking around with what we would say suboptimal or subclinical cerebral perfusion or very low blood flow to the brain. Um, your brain has over 400 miles of capillary networks. So people don't think about it, right? 86 billion neurons, trillions of connections. One single neuron in your brain can make up to 10,000 connections which, with its neighbors. Now, I, I like to tell people that fun fact because I'm the person who used to dissect brains and literally look at individual neurons. So I think I have an appreciation of it at that micro level. That's am um, amazing. Because most people never get to look at their brain. This is why it's fun to do podcasts, just kind of get people more excited about it. Right. Um, but when it comes to really healthy brain function, we want good blood flow. And the scans that we did in the clinical setting show us people's blood flow. And because I've seen thousands of scans, our brain imaging database during my tenure had over 130,000 scans. Okay. So I've seen thousands of brain images and low blood flow to the brain, not good. You need blood flow to bring oxygen to the cells, nutrients to the cells, hormones to the cells, enzymes to the cells, and you want them to, have, to be able to release um, waste. So again, we want healthy perfusion. When you play a sport like football, right? You have all those repetitive impacts over time because it's damaging the neurons and the vasculature, the blood vessels. So that um, we call it the acceleration deceleration forces that right, happen right. Right, upon right. impact. Again, I tell you, they sort of shear and tear the neurons and the blood vessels. So then they have to repair. The beautiful thing about the brain is it's always repairing itself. Always. It's continually in this state mm -hmm. of repair. It's the, the problem is as we age, if we don't take care of our brain, you know, at, by the time you hit age 40, brain volume begins to decrease about 5% per decade, which is why when you hit your uh -oh. sixth and seventh decade of life, right, we start to see these degenerative processes happen. So we need to think about taking care of our brain, right, while we're young and healthy. Although, as I talk about in the book, even at 90, we've been able to restore and reverse and improve brain function. So it doesn't matter what age you're, if you're listening to this podcast and you're 70 and you wanna get brain healthy and improve cerebral circulation, you can. Um, but getting back to the football players, they, they have very damaged brains compared to the general public. Um, and it's just because of the repetitive head, head impacts. Now, most people walking around might not realize that, um, because we kind of call those injuries invisible brain injuries, right. but they're impacting the physiology, right, of, of the brain. Getting back to the book, Biohack Your Brain, the reason why I wrote this book and gave it that title is the neuroimaging showed these very accessible dietary and lifestyle components practiced daily. So that's the really important thing. Daily. It's, the con it's the continual practice over time. So the players in our study i followed for the first well they stayed in our study for years but we had them come back after the first six months and we scanned their brains and showed the improvement in blood flow and i think i've showed those scans to you during yes. that presentation yep. when you see the visual of the 
beautiful brain perfusion from what it first looked like to just doing these very simple um, dietary and lifestyle changes, it is mind blowing. I, in fact, I wish I couldn't even believe it. You know, it's taken me seeing thousands of these to go, wow, this is even I didn't realize how powerful these steps were. So the biohack piece is the neuroimaging result showing the physiological changes to the brain that and it's not just after six months, our players would come back a year later, two years later. Sometimes we rescanned later because we did additional interventions and we wanted to make sure we weren't going backwards. Um, so these are the interventions that work. And this is why this book is so unique because I wanted to take the guesswork out of what to do, right? Because we hear about right. brain health, right? You can go into the whole foods and you walk down the supplement aisle and you're just bombarded. You're like, sure. well, I think I'm supposed to take a fish oil and I've heard that curcumin is good. What do I take? How much do I take? What brain do I take? Does this really work? You know, is this just expensive it's, it's, urine? It's, it's just another thing in life that's we're, we're hit with so many options and so many choices, right? And right. And, um, but you know, going what your studies prove, it's the the scene is believing, right? And then the See, data. And even the data. for me, I am an right. objective scientist. I do not believe anything unless I see it, and I was shocked. Now I've been doing this, you know, with the neuroimaging piece for well over a decade. I've seen enough scans. I've worked with enough patients and have seen the transformations and it's extraordinary. You know, the so data, yeah, the data is telling the story and then the, the physical results that people are, are feeling and doing. So man, I'm, people well, that's, the, that's the other, that's the other piece, right? Our, our whole goal was to improve people's quality of life and do it in a way that is the most helpful with the least side effects, you know, easy enough to do. And, Again, the book was about how do I make this really simple? These are the things that work. Um, and if you don't believe me, go get a baseline scan and then let's have you follow the protocol and do a follow up. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. it's like I'll put my money where my mouth is. Like I, I have seen, we do precision medicine. So even with quantitative EEGs, which I actually want to go do in the fire station, I was thinking about going to the one down the street and offering to do that. EEGs with some of the firefighters and then follow up um, some neurofeedback to help. So EEG, for those who don't know, um, is a non-invasive way to measure the electrical activity of the brain. And we're we all familiar it, with ECGs or EKGs. Oh, right? you know, okay, you know that. You know EKGs, that. We, you, we, you look at the, the heart. Electric, the electric, mm -hmm. electrical activity of the heart, and this is just for the brain. We're looking at it for the brain. And the reason why I'm really interested in that is because firefighters, right, uh, deal with post-traumatic stress and anxiety. Um, and I was thinking, why don't I do some kind of pilot uh, study just to support the firefighters, do a baseline EEG, do some neurofeedback. The neurofeedback piece is a non-invasive way, non-pharmaceutical approach okay. to help stabilize the network connectivity between neurons. So. In essence, when you're anxious, your neurons are just firing too much. And I want to turn the dial down on that. And instead of using alcohol to do it, which a lot of people do, that's why they drink alcohol, just to quiet their neurons knock, down. Yeah, knock down the edge, right? What if I was able to stabilize those networks, the neural networks, so that you didn't have to do that? Um, that's what's going to help you to be able to be sharper, clear, because if you're going out on a fire call, I don't want you to be anxious. I want you to be relaxed and focused and clear minded. So um, anyways, I, I love precision medicine and this is super this, cool. the, e, the EEG technology is so easy and I think it can be so helpful in firefighters um, and it's it's. You know, there's really no side effects to helping stabilize those network activities. And it's a little bit like doing your feedback a little bit like going to the gym and trying to build your bicep muscles or build your quads. So you do it repeatedly over time. And when you work those particular networks into a more stable pattern, they will stay. Mm. Right. So if you're going to if you're going to train your brain, you don't just do it once. You do it over a series of, of sessions, but you have the objective um, EEG is the follow-up to show you that your brain is now 
I don't even want to call it normalized. You know, we compare it to a database mm. of um, individuals that will be your age and gender. Okay. So if I were to do it with you, I would do the EEG and then compare you to that normative database and see are there areas of your brain that are working too hard? Are there areas that are not working hard enough, right? Are you actually struggling and maybe there's memory issues? And we can just kind of work those circuits. So imagine you can do that piece, hmm. plus the nutraceutical piece, plus the right kind of diet and habits. Um, so that's you, how you take care of your brain for a lifetime. And you, and you get to live to the age of almost 100, like Betty White. Right? So, so you've got us all in suspense a little bit. So let's talk about some of okay. those things. Let's talk about some of those things we, we can or should be doing mm -hmm. um, that will contribute to the things that you're talking about. And because I would love to have an EEG. And I like that going from the kind of the before and after look, right? Mm. And seeing that improvement. But, but is, what that, is that not biohacking? Right? I mean, that's really why this has the title. You know, it's it's seeing the physiological evidence using neuroimaging. And I don't, outside of Dr. Amen, I don't know that any other books out there or anybody else is really saying this because they just, it's not their wheelhouse, right? This right. is, you know, a very specific area of research and to be able to see, wow, we can do these very simple things consistently to take care of our brain it's really important well, it's so a, it's, it sounds like it's a it's a team approach with the science with you with mm -hmm. people, you know um scientists uh, such as yourself um following the science but it's also it's a partnership but it's not just relying on the world of medicine to take care of it right it's well it's, i it's like empowering medicine. yeah i like empowering people to be able to take care of their own health i mean we need our doctors you know, to, to oh, diagnose and treat diseases. But, you know, much the way people take care of their body to be fit and healthy, I want to add the brain piece to it. And trust me, nobody taught me about taking care of my brain ever. Like, I don't think I would even know this unless I was in the field of neuroscience. So I feel this is coming out more in the collective consciousness because we've been through a pandemic and people are much more open to nutritional interventions, right? So during the pandemic, people started taking vitamin D and vitamin C and zinc and quercetin. And people didn't even know what quercetin is. It's just a, yeah, it's, a <laughs> it's a phytonutrient from an apple, believe it or not. And that helps zinc get into cells and zinc is an antiviral. And that's why it's so helpful for COVID. Um, people, because they've had COVID, you've got people who have long hauler issues and psychiatric issues and mental health issues. So I love how people are now thinking more about their brain health because of what we've gone through. So, so let's hit some of, let's hit some, so of the, let, let's, let's, hit, some let's hit, let's hit like the key items. Cause and, and again, there's you, so the, many, the, there's so many, I could probably is, rattle off a hundred, but gonna, I, <laughs> there's going to be a second podcast. You know that you're coming back. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so some of my favorites to start, if, if I were to give people some general recommendations to okay. start now, um, when I used to teach my brain directed weight loss groups, this is what I would have everybody do week one, drink half your body's weight in ounces of water each day. Oh, wow. So if you are a 200 pound man listening to this, that's so 200, right? Right. Divided by two is yep. 100 ounces. Okay. Okay. That's what I want you to have. So drink the fluids, the water is so critical for your brain health. And it's the number one thing people don't do. I guarantee you Hydration. those fluids can be green juices. They can be soups. They can be, um, I don't want anything with sugar. I okay. want it to be very clean. So think of the clear, water is really the clear best liquid, clear liquids primarily. I mean, soups. Yeah, but well, well I think heavy, of that as part, sweet, not heavy. In the I sweet. think I, I like, so, so, cause I'm going to get to the sugar thing is number two, uh, okay. the, the number of grams of sugar you're going to have per day. Okay. One of the things we used to say in the clinic is don't drink your calories. So okay. if you're, and if you're somebody who does drink your calories, if you just went this year and really only did water, um, and maybe a cup of coffee a day, you know, I could do a whole thing. We've talked about coffee. One cup a day is okay. That caffeine, um, can be dehydrating to the system. So, and it amps you up and it constricts your blood vessels. So 
from a brain imaging perspective, we always told people if you're coming in to get your brain scan, no caffeine, no chocolate, no coffee. So again, think about that now every day. Do you really want caffeine? So we do want to eliminate caffeine, but I'm okay with one cup of one coffee. Cup. If you want to do day, one, get the day going. That's okay. But it's the water. So it's a staple so, at the firehouse. Just you know that. I, I have okay. I am sure it is. Can we make remember I want to make green juicing? Like I put a juicer in every firehouse across America. Right. Um the juicing is really key. I will tell you, I've got all my football players doing a green juice a day. And if you love coffee and want to have more than one cup, then for every cup you have, pair it with a green juice. So, and when I say green juice, I'm just saying, get a get a juicer, put spinach, celery, cucumber, parsley, anything green. That's why we call it green. Why okay. is that so important? It's alkaline, it's hydrating, it's loaded with enzymes. It'll actually help um the the digestive enzymes that are in there will actually help with digestion in your stomach so i i like that and uh phytonutrients antioxidants when we think about the brain <laughs> what causes brain aging is it's a combination of free rad so there's free radicals in your brain and there's antioxidants Free radicals are just generated by um, metabolic processes in the cells, right, right? right? Even if you're exercising, you're just going to kick off a lot of metabolic waste and free radicals. Those free radicals damage your cells. They can poke holes in cell membranes. The free radicals can damage your DNA. But thankfully, we have antioxidants in our brain. We already have an antioxidant system. So there's this really dynamic balance that goes on in the brain. If we overload our system with um, if we smoke, right, if we eat an unhealthy diet, um, if we have too much inflammation, that can cause free radical damage. So you want as many antioxidants as you can get in your diet each day. Green juicing is just a big check mark, right? If you just did one of those and you can throw in a green apple or throw in a pear, you can throw in a piece of fruit. Um, but I've been doing it for 20 years. I, I, I teach yeah. pretty much everybody I work with to like learn to love it because it's hydrating as well. So, okay. Okay. So we now, got so the water. What about somebody, what about, what about somebody to say, well, anything commercially, and obviously we're not here to endorse oh, product. We're not here to endorse right. product, but, but um, making it yourself is probably the best by far, but are there right. commercial, are there commercially See, available products that are acceptable? You could get a fresh pressed green juice. I, I, I like when people make it and then yeah. drink it within 15 um, to 20 minutes of making it because right. that's when the enzymes, everything's fresh. Over time, enzymes denature. So we actually want, um, we want it to be as fresh as possible. So pressed juices or green juices, yes, you can buy them out of bottles. So I always look at things on a continuum. If you're not going to juice, um, you know, you can buy the bottles, look at the sugar content. So sure. now we're going to get to, we're going to get to number two. Okay. When I teach my groups um, in week two, I say, let's count how many grams of sugar that we're having mm -hmm. each day. So the average American consumes between a hundred to 150 grams of sugar per day. But the American Heart Association recommends no more than 25 grams for women and 36 grams for men per day That's daily daily now when i taught my groups and i mean i started teaching these back in 2009 and did them for many years and i talk about this in the book most people in my groups were averaging about 75 grams of sugar per day it is so easy sugar is everywhere it's it just is. everywhere pervasive and it's everywhere and i don't expect people to get down to 25 or 36 grams it's actually pretty um challenging but do your best because if you want to be brain healthy when your sugars are low and balanced you are talk about having great cognitive function and you know we want to make sure i mean one of the contributors to uh, alzheimer's is diabetes so 75 million americans are struggling with diabetes you know it's something that we have to be very careful of and there's a type 3 alzheimer's we kind of call it a type 3 um, that's based, it's like a, a sugar-based Alzheimer's oh, wow. so type three, where, you know, if you're a diabetic, you're not able to get the sugar into the neurons in your brain. So it's like an insulin resistance in the brain. Okay. If we can't get the sugars into the cells, they can't work well. 
and you won't have the sharp memory. So anyways, getting back to number two, okay. <laughs> managing sugars and getting back to the question you were asking about, can I get you know, a green juice off the shelf? Um, just look at how many sugars there are in the bottle. And here is my rule of thumb for everybody in my group, no more than five grams of sugar per serving. So you can kind of use that as your baseline. If it's five grams of sugar per serving or less, go ahead and have it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because so what does a typical can of soda have? Like 30, oh, 40, some, 40 some? Oh yeah, it's. I think it's like 30 grams of sugar. Yeah, you drink one, one can one, of soda, you've blown yeah, it for done. the day. You're done, You're done for the day. I will tell you, in my family, this was so cute. I came back for Christmas one year and you back in Chicago and it was my um, my cousin's husband. He just, for one year, he stopped drinking soda and lost 20 pounds. He did nothing else, didn't change any of his other dietary habits. People don't realize that just drinking soda puts so much weight on your oh, body. Oh yeah, it's just calories. And, and But the, people and don't know that, they don't know it. Oh, so okay. don't drink your calorie, not the diet, don't calorie. drink the diet sodas. Oh, I was going to go there. Diet sodas are, are toxic, aren't they? I mean, they're bad. No diet soda, no, and the aspartame. Well, I'll tell you, my dad being a pilot, you know, and he was an international pilot. So we had a place in Berlin, Germany, um, New York, and then we were in Chicago. So pilots, you know, in the 70s and 80s, they were drinking the darn diet sodas. And he started having... Um, you know, in your eyes, you get these little floaters and sp little floaters and sparks okay. that would okay. happen in the eyes. And so they told the pilots, I remember my dad telling me this, not to drink the diet sodas. It's because the aspartame, that aspartame can be excitotoxic to cells. Mm. So it's just easier, you know, if, if you really need to have that carbonated feel, some people will do uh, club sodas and then you could squeeze some lemon in it. So there's always lots of cool oh, sort yeah. of brain hacks or brain upgrades. But remember, if you did that diet soda every single day, like my mom did, diet Verner's and Tab. Oh my Verner's. God, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm probably aging myself right now. No, but no, yes, Verner, that yeah, is. <laughs> I remember Verner's. I love Verner's, but I my, did it every once in a while, not diet. And then uh, yeah. Tab, remember Tab? Oh, yeah, Tab, remember Tab, the, all the that. Product. It's, you know, it's funny. People be like, okay, she's telling me not to do this. You know, it's, I will tell you in the clinical setting, we lived our message. Everybody at the Amen Clinics were yeah. not allowed to have any sodas. We, everything is brain healthy. If you were going to have a lunch that wasn't brain healthy, you had to eat it outside of the clinic. I mean, I live everything I teach you, everything I teach. And I think if you read the book and all the stories I have in there, patients that I've worked with, they know, like, I'm, and I'm teaching this to you because I've seen so many people go through the neurological issues, ALS, you know, Guillain-Barre, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, various kinds of dementia. And I, I say no brain left behind. I don't care if you have that. I have patients I work with that have those things. We still put them in hyperbaric oxygen chambers and do neurofeedback in the things that help them to have better quality of life. Um, one of my favorite patients is 75 and he's when we look at somebody's brain, you can get an MRI and we measure hippocampal volume. Okay. So the hippocampus is the area of the brain involved in learning and memory. Memory. And when it shrinks, you know, that means you're going to have a harder time with cognitive function. So this gentleman's hippocampus is literally at the fifth percentile. So mm. it's, it's pretty small. But he is rocking and roll. We still do things, brain healthy things. We've got more blood flow to his brain. He's so happy you know <laughs> for me it's about enhancing people's quality of life and i will meet you wherever you're at at any stage and i've seen so many people be able to have better mental health better cognitive health you know we've seen it with the scans you know better lives so you know my whole goal the heart is trying to just help people get them on that path and if, if you do nothing but drink your water and your green juice, keep your sugars low, you're already 10 steps to the head of the game. You know, we've got the supplements. I've talked to you before okay. about yep. Yep. sort of my, my three top, if I'm just going to give you three. Yeah, let's go, let's, I think let's go with the three. And then I think there's enough to continue talking about that. I think we want to have you come back and we'll, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll go a little deeper into the nutraceuticals 
and some of the other um, things that you recommend. So, yeah. so we've yeah. got hydration, hydration yeah. and in the green juicing reduction green or elimination as much as possible. We're never going to eliminate it, like you said, but reduction of sugars. And so what's number three here as yeah. we wrap up? Well, let's do uh, a little supplement blitz. So I'm going to give you the three that I okay. feel everybody, anybody who's listening to this podcast, that's over the age of 40. If you're under 40, you're probably fine. But uh a good high quality multivitamin multi-mineral because as we age neurotransmitter production goes down you know serotonin dopamine um, gaba and we need neurotransmitters for good mental health right okay. anxiety depression so just multivitamin multi-mineral supplement i can send you you have my supplement recommendation I guide do. so you're yes. able to if you want to share that or uh, maybe if- if you don't mind, I'll put it in. I'll put it in as a either an attachment as the show or a link, link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then it kind of gives brands that I trust and have used. Um, and I follow two. them. I follow them. So I'm I'm one for one. Okay, one for one so far. Let's. Keep okay, going. okay, one for one. Number two, omega three fatty acids two, are two. essential for brain health, eye health, anti-inflammatory. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids are also essential for your mental health. So people don't realize if you struggle with anxiety, depression, ADD, you actually need to have those good omegas. And we, I can get into the, you know, I could go in a whole deep dive uh, I know, about I know. omega-3 you, fatty you acids. You make it fascinating I, for us lay people. Out well, well, and I will tell you just, and I like to share this, you know, we put all of our football players on the brain-directed multivitamin and omega-3 fatty acid. And they realized they had less joint pain. So if anybody's listening and they're struggling with arthritis or joint pain, you need the omega-3 fatty acids. One to two grams a day are really important. In the supplement guide, I give a vegan recommendation. So there's some people who do not you know, eat right. fish, and I completely appreciate that. And I actually take the vegan myself. Um, fish is really essential. To, to keep, it actually keeps your brain, vol- it helps you maintain brain volume as you age. So remember I was saying brain volume shrinks after the age of 40, 40 5%, 5% each decade, and then it accelerates after age 70. I don't want to hear this. <laughs> That's okay though. I find you got me here. I'm going to keep you healthy. Uh, and if there's any women listening to this, it's the omega threes are great for your hair, skin, and nails. So sushi's good, yes, for the omega threes. If you like sushi, so, oh yeah, you can do sushi. Okay. I prefer cook, but cooked is obviously going to be better than raw. But yes, <laughs> I do love sushi. Trust me, that's oh one yes, of my, me too. One of my favorites. But um, you really want to have one to two servings per week of fish, baked or broiled fish, if you can. Okay. Um, I could go into neuroimaging study. So all of the data that I share with people, by the way, is neuroimaging backed. This is why I don't just give great data. And it's not just from me. It's from my colleagues in the peer reviewed literature. I'm doing the things that will literally help you to maintain your brain volume and brain function over time. Okay. So we got multivitamin, multimineral, high quality omega-3 fatty acid, one, one to two grams per okay. day. Okay. Um, and then number three, vitamin D, mm. the, the shining star of uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, vitamin D, because it helps with depression and it helps with uh, Alzheimer's. So we tend to find vitamin D levels very low in people with depression and Alzheimer's. So it's also great for your bones. It's great for your immune system. Anybody's even in cancer, addition. Even in addition to the vitamin E, that would be in the multivitamin, still have some. Correct. Uh-huh. Correct. So the levels are really important. You, a very baseline level of vitamin D is going to be 2,000 international units per day. In the clinical setting, we do labs on everybody, and pretty much 90% of people who walk through the door, their vitamin D levels are too low. Uh, the numbers go between 30 to 100. Um, 30 is the low end of normal, but in our clinical setting, if we're working to help you have the best brain health you can, we want you to be at 60. So in order to get to between 60 to 80, you typically are going to need to have more like 5,000 international units or even up to 10,000 international units. Now, I don't like people to have to do guesswork. So what you do is the next time you get your labs done, and I hope you're doing a basic lab panel every year, in the book, 
I, in the book, in the last chapter, I tell you sort of the 10 basic labs everybody should get done. There's actually a whole brain health series that I could put together for that, but I just kept it the 10 basic labs. Um, you want to get the vitamin D done. It's very inexpensive. Once you get that number, uh, and, and if you do, if anybody's listening and you actually want to reach out to me and share your lab values, you know, you can go to my website and I will look at it for you and help give the recommendation. But typically, if you're only at 30 when you get your labs done, you'd want to bump it up to probably 5,000 international units of vitamin D. Take that for three months, get retested. Okay. So, all right, so we've, is good we've, for your we've got we've got a jumping uh, a launch pad for our next conversation. So recap. I like this, and I think firefighters can do all of these things. We right? can. Do, we certainly can. Yeah. So, um, water hydration, um, two hundred pound person, hundred ounces uh, of water per day per throughout day, the day. Mm -hmm. Per day, um, and then green juicing, a must. Right. Everybody, every my dad did juicing. So I know as a firefighter, if like if my dad can juice every day and he did all kinds, he did carrot and beet and you minimize so, minimize the sugars. Minimize the sugars. Let's try to keep our sugars low. I didn't even put the meat. I didn't even talk about meat in this podcast episode. We'll do it. We'll save that one for next time. Okay. And then and then supplement supplements. So a high quality multivitamin, omega yes. three, omega three, yes. and then and vitamin D. Yes. Okay. I think these are the basics everybody can do. I go into a whole lot more, you know, in the book. I know. Uh, could, and maybe next time we could do a whole blitz because I just have so many, but I like it to be accessible. And if you did these things that we just mentioned today and nothing else consistently over the course of a decade, I guarantee you it's going to help change your brain health. That's guarantee. Awesome. Well, listen, I can't thank you enough for spending time. Um, your enthusiasm, your passion for it comes shining through in a huge Aww. way and your knowledge is, you know, incomparable. So um, you're going to have to come back and, and share a little, impart some uh, more of this knowledge so we can, we can improve the health of our brains because um, I want to talk to you next time about exercise, right? It's component in mm -hmm. enhancing it. And then, you know, go a little deeper into, into some of the studies and also um, some of some of the other things that you would recommend. So I think we've got to easily enough for another another get together oh i would be honored to come back if anybody listens and wants to give you any questions for our next podcast okay. too I, I i welcome them i mean there's so much that we can do for the brain well, but i want to monitor that yeah yeah that's yeah, a great idea i i want it you know i just want to make this accessible and not hard you know we can go deep hey if you've got a really you know unusual issue or something that you wanted to discuss um, maybe another brain health tip. We'll, we'll do like a final one. Um, yes, yes. Try not to drink your water out of the plastic bottles. So limit plastics, the BPA from plastic. So if you can, you know, get them in glass jars or get um, a water filter. I was just talking, uh, not talking, I was just reading a book that they talked about um, cans aluminum cans in the yeah. lining to prevent them from rusting right because the acidity of the drinks in them right they didn't have the lining they'd rust right through these the, the super thin aluminum and that there potentially could be some concern with even the linings in the aluminum cans so let's uh let's save some of that for our next we can call. we can delve in yeah there are all kinds of small little things that you can do around the house um okay. and i think i put the water filters in the supplement guide that i have at the bottom Okay. You know, just to make it's these little things that you practice. I'm telling you, it's like for the firefighters, you clean your PPE, right? You're healthier. Yep. And it's those little, little, little things. Cleaning the outside. Now we're doing take care of the inside. Okay. And then, and then I'll come to a fire station near you with my EEG cap. <laughs> I, I'll volunteer right out of the gate. So. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Well, such a pleasure speaking with you today. Oh, I had so much fun. Yeah, the pleasure is all ours. And um, we're just we're grateful to you. And I think people are going to at least start to think a little bit more um, about the things that you've mentioned. And uh, we'll go a little we'll go a little deeper next time and, and get more into the, the proverbial weeds about about this, because it's fascinating. And we all more we're more cognizant than ever, especially in the fire service, uh, more cognizant cognizant than ever to um be mindful in how we take care of ourselves and then the mental health component is 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 come to the forefront more than ever and i think maybe we can yeah. talk also about 
um, that as well, right? Um, well, that's that's why I specifically mentioned those three supplements, by the way, because they will support your mental health. Excellent. Right, the multivitamin will support the neurotransmitter production, which you need. The omega three fatty acids help the receptors that sit in the cell membranes that modulate right the dopamine, the GABA to work more efficiently. And then the vitamin D. If we make sure that levels up high enough, you're less likely to be depressed. So it, I, I'm very strategic when I make uh, these recommendations, but I also like to teach. I like to teach the why. Yeah, you have a teacher so that, part, no doubt. You so that you part. don't just do it like, oh, she told me to take these things, and then you try for a month and give it up. No, I actually want to inspire you to continue because um, it, it will help. And like mm-hmm. I said, omega threes will help the joint health. <laughs> well, we like we like to know the why's. I think that's important yeah. to us for for creating that buy-in and understanding. So, Dr. Yes. Dr. Kristen Willemeyer, thank you, and uh, we'll see you again soon. I can't wait. Thank you so much, Tom. Such a pleasure. Likewise, thank you.